So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Emacs today and some various packages we like. Uh, the first one, the main thing I'm going to talk about right today is use package, which is a macro for declaring the packages you want to use. And in demonstrating use package, you will see some other packages uh, I've been using lately. So if you're just starting out configuring your Emacs, maybe the most you've done so far is use the customization interface, which has written out stuff for you into your .emacs file. But there will come a time when you want to do a little bit something more. You want to write some Lisp code yourself. You want to add some custom key bindings. You want to add something to a mode hook. There are certain things the customization interface isn't really well suited to, so you want to put that code in your .emacs. And that's a very simple and easy thing to do. But as many people have discovered, the larger the file gets, the more unmanageable it gets. And I, I found myself having to sort of declare init file bankruptcy a few times because my file was just getting so unwieldy. And I would have changes in one part that affected changes in another part, but I was unaware of those other changes. I'd forgotten about them. So I would have things break, and it would take a long time of debugging to figure out why. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create something that would make package configuration easy to construct, but also keeps it sane, keeps it rational by focusing all the configuration into one place and then giving you a way to very quickly say, no, I'm not using this right now, just completely turn it off and disable all of its influence on my Emacs and on my environment. So we'll take a look at my init file here. Um, and it, this file might look a little bit crazy because uh, not every, not 100% of it is under use package yet. That's sort of an evolving thing. But the main thing I do is I bring in use package here, and you don't need any of this extra stuff. For, the, for, for typical usage, I would recommend just doing this to bring use package in. Just require use package. And what that does for you is it brings a macro into scope called use package. So we'll go to the first use of it. Um, these are very simple uses where I'm pulling in elisp libraries that other packages are probably going to depend on. And I am defer loading all of them, which means I don't want to actually require or load the contents of these packages. I just want to make them available. So the fact that I have a defer and a load path, basically the effect of this use package line is going to be to add this to my load path. Why am I using the use package macro to do that is just for consistency's sake. I want every package mentioned to be under the aegis of a use package macro. Now there's a great package called macro expand. Uh, or macro, yeah, macro, macro okay. step, I think it's called. Let's see, yeah, macro step, and that will let me expand this use package macro to show you what it's going to become. And so that says at both byte compilation time and at evaluation or load time, I want to add this path to the load path. Mm -hmm. That's all it does. Nothing special. If I had not had the defer there this would have done a lot more. Oh, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> it would have added the path to the load path, but then it would have also required in the package, but not just require it. It would have required it softly, allowing it to fail. And if it had failed, print out a harmless message to the messages buffer. Because mm -hmm. if you have the same init file on multiple machines, you may not have the same packages on every machine. So you want to say, configure what you can configure not this must be configured, although keyword could be added for that in the future, I imagine. And then the other thing it's going to do is because I have verbosity for use package enabled, it's going to wrap the load in a uh, timing section so that I can see how much time it's going to take to load that package. So I will collapse that, bring back my defer, and that's what those do. So those aren't my real, those aren't, here's the first real one. The first real one is this great package I've been using a lot recently, which is an interface to GNU Global called ggtags. And for ggtags, I want to, again, add it to the load path. And I do this, I used to have elisp code on startup that would dive down into my directory tree and find out where every package I used was. But I discovered that that was taking up 30% of my startup time. <laughs> just scanning the directories. directories and it's expensive to read through them all so yeah. I decided that uh, sort of the philosophy of use package is to be targeted and specific mm -hmm. and to have a declaration that's going to work or do nothing on every machine where you use it mm -hmm. so here I want to say that ggtags lives under my site list in a directory called ggtags there is a command to invoke this package called ggtags mode 
by specifying that there is a command to invoke it, that immediately causes it to be defer loaded. So I don't need to bring this package in until somebody has asked to run the command ggtags mode. Mm -hmm. So we'll see that if I expand this here. We'll see that what has happened is, is it put that path on the load path as before. And then if the ggtags mode command does not already have a binding, we bind it to an auto load to that module. And then after the package has loaded, so that's the defer part, then we diminish the minor mode. And uh, diminish just says, I don't want to see ggtags uh, information displayed in my minor mode string. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of minor modes like to advertise the fact that they're enabled down in the, down in the mode line. So that's a very simple use package, but actually I'd say half of my use packages are that simple because I'm basically doing those few things. I am adding a path to the load path. I am declaring a command that, that will cause this package to get loaded. And in many cases, if a minor mode is involved, I'm diminishing. Mm -hmm. There's a preface keyword on the next use package that I haven't come across before. <laughs> What's that? So, <clears throat> With my more complex use package declarations, I often want to write my own list function. But I mentioned before that use package tries to be defensive in its loading of packages, and so it wraps it in this guard that allows it to fail. So mm -hmm. all of the actual configuration codes ends up inside an if. And what that means to the byte compiler is, I don't know whether this if will be followed at runtime or not. So I can't know whether that function is actually going to be defined later on in the file. So there will be a byte compiler warning saying this function is not known to be defined at runtime. Mm -hmm. The preface is a set of functions and also def bars work and, and a few other things might, want to, might go in the preface like your own manual auto loads. These are things that are related to the package but come before everything else. They come before the, the, the guard of the require, they come before they come after the setting of the load path, but they come uh, before the if. You could conditionally say, "I only want to use this this package if there is a windowing system available." For example, it comes yeah. before that, so that if you define a function in your preface, you can use that function in the if predicate. Okay, and seeing that if example, by the way, is, is quite helpful because I often get questions from people who want to you may make parts to their, uh, their config run only on Linux or only in Mac or only in Windows and so forth. So having a, having a quick way to have that if there is very nice. Right, so if we wanted um, system type, so I could say if EQ system type, uh, was it GNU Linux? Mm-hmm. Would be one way to do it, and then it, uh, and then you can flip it by saying unless you can say unless it's Linux, yeah. it's not Linux, then do this. Speaking of uh, different systems, one of the things I I remember coming across um, when someone told me about it was a uh, was the ensure keyword, which lets you install things if they're not installed yet. That's right. You know, I can't really speak much about the ensure keyword because I did <laughs> not write that support and I don't use it. Um, it, it uses the package.el machinery to guarantee that a package has been installed on the system. Yeah. And it also works at byte compilation time so that when you go to byte compile, it will, it will make sure at that time to realize the whole system and all of its set of dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, it's as easy to use as just saying ensure T, and then that will cause the abrev package to be pulled in if need yeah. be. Um, I, but I don't yeah. use it. I've been having a hard time wrapping my mind around how use package and the package system work. So like in my config, and I know I must be doing something wrong because I call like package initialize a couple of times to try to just get <laughs> everything going. Um, and I was, I, I guess you don't use the package system much then or? No, I don't. I, I manually install everything just because I guess I'm from the days before package <laughs> stuff. So I like to know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess I might have to dig into that myself. Uh, the way that I've been using it is, uh, and I, I'm actually, let me um, uh, let me share my screen. Hang on a second here. Uh, share, share, share. And then you can point out how what I'm doing terribly wrong. Hang on, did I, Emacs. Emacs, one of these screens is an Emacs thing. Okay, let me make sure I'm not showing anything embarrassing. Okay, good. All right, share. Okay. So what I do in my config is I package initialize nil, which I think it just, hang on a second, let me bring up the uh, config for that one, um, which it, so it loads all the packages 
uh, mm -hmm. at least all the auto loads. And then what I end up using the use package for is basically like a easy to read eval after load with um with the init and uh the other thing i like that you do ver you do very well is having bind uh the, the key bindings in a nice easy to read format right so that's what i've been using it for but I've, i i'm not really sure if i'm doing this right because i do have that kind of package initialize load everything um which which uh, use package is supposed to help me get around <laughs> Right. Well, what, one of the other motivations I had with use package is that in all of the packages I have installed on my system, and there's many, there's many, there's several hundred. There's a whole lot of auto load cookies in there mm -hmm. uh, to tell the you know the auto load gathering mechanism of Emacs to go fetch this, you know, add this function, add this function, add this function. Mm -hmm. That file was taking a long time to load. Actually, yeah. I think five to seven seconds because it had gotten several hundred k in size. So the other thing I wanted use package to do for me was to be very targeted, like surgical, have only the auto loads that I'm going to use, only the load path additions that I'm going to use. So package initialize is pulling in a lot of auto loads for you yeah. that you may not need them all. Like in that use package for Helm desk binds there, that bind keyword is going to implicitly introduce auto loads for those two for that command Helm desk binds. And you can delete the uh, defer keyword, by the way, there. Yeah. Uh, binding, uh, binding like that implies a, a deferred load. So okay. then you're getting, you're getting a single auto load, and that's it from your use package declaration. Right. Further, if you later decide to disable Helm Desk Binds, you will not, not have that auto load. So it will not be a command you could accidentally trip, for example. Ah, so what I should try doing is I should try getting rid of the package initialize and then specifying uh, the, the actual commands or, or uh, other things that I, I use and use package will, will define the auto loads for them. I'm just wondering if that means I would end up having to define the paths to them because I, I like the way that the package, um, well, the package EL just manages the installs and updates and paths and all of that stuff for me. If you like that, I would say keep it. The only reason not to have it is, as I said, to be more specific. And what yeah. you gain from the specificity really is load speed. Yeah. If you don't mind, if you only run your Emacs once every few days and you don't <laughs> mind it taking ten seconds to start up, well, then use package. I it mean, does. I'm not use package the macro. Use package initialize because yes, you'll yes. get a lot of benefit for free. And then you can use the use package macro just for key bindings and modes and interpreters and, and you know that kind of thing. Yeah. So that that kind of suggests several ways that you can take advantage or that people can take advantage of use package. There's the you know kind of quick and easy config for people like me who already have stuff in packages, but who just want to be able to say, all right, when this package actually gets loaded, run this Emacs list to configure it or bind these key bindings or whatever. Um, and then there are speed demons like you who like testing Emacs list code in fresh new Emacs. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so end up starting and, and closing Emacs all the time. Right. I, I, when I'm actively developing on something, I may start and stop a few hundred times a day. And so with use package, despite the fact that I configure 218 packages at the moment, I got the load time on my Mac, and this is a load time of a graphical <laughs> Emacs down to a third of a second. Yeah, is that something like I've seen some people start using um, Emacs in batch mode with ERT, and they just run that. But I guess for more interactive functions, you do want to get into the environment and play around with things when you're testing. Well, certainly using ERT is a more evolved way of doing testing. Uh, with use package, I kind of need to look at the macro expansion. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Okay, so use package for more readable configuration. <laughs> right. And let's, so let's look at some of the configuration related things it can do. Um, I do want to point out, you see the disabled keyword in here I have here on the rev? Yep. The expansion then is nil. Mm. So if you byte compile your init.el, all the packages you have disabled, because I like to play around with packages and then decide I'm not going to use them, but I want to keep the configuration around to keep that knowledge in case I decide to use it in the future, but I don't mm -hmm. want to have to pay for it being there. <laughs> and that's more efficient than saying if nil, or does that work out to the same evaluation? Uh, it may work out to the same thing, but then again, you run into the byte compilation. Well, no, you may not run into the byte compilation issue because the predicate there is a uh, is a constant. Uh -huh. I haven't tried that. Okay. Um, yeah. That's so cool. this, this just integrates in with everything else. Yeah.
Right. So as you saw, key binding, which you can give one or more of, is um, sets up an auto load and binds this key. There is syntax now. This uses the bind key package. Yeah. There is syntax now to do things like this, but it's but it's in a moment it will be accessible. <laughs> right now there's an error filtering <laughs> stage that happens where use package will tell you whether your keywords are valid or not. Uh -huh. This does not pass the validator even though it, it would work if it did. Huh. So that's that's coming soon. That's nice. I, I often find myself wanting to bind a um, a mode map so instead of doing it in config or in it I can't you I actually can't really remember the difference between the two which you will explain in a moment anyway so the new keyword will be quite handy right and you can mix the two as well so you could say mm -hmm. um, like this something like this and then what that would say is that meta H would have would be in the global key binding set mm -hmm. and then within the ace jump mode map I want control X you know whatever the jump mode maps prefix is followed by yeah. control X I want it to exit the main button. okay Okay, that looks really handy. Um, the other thing the binding logic is doing for you, in addition to just being in this nice compact syntax, is that after Emacs is loaded, you can run a command, describe personal key bindings. And that I will show that. you every key binding you have ever established with the bind keyword or calling bind key directly. Yeah. And then if any of these override something that previously had a definition to your use of bind, it will be in the comments column. I, so I... I was wondering if there was something I should be binding to control HK, describe key, to, to give me that sort of information when I'm looking at the key binding itself. Mm, that would be handy. That would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, it will do the normal describe key function, but also maybe at the end say, you know, this used to be this other command, so that when I'm helping other people and I'm talking about this lovely, you know, uh, Control HK or whatever shortcut, I can remember that I actually bound it to something else and other people don't have the same behavior. Right, right, right. But yeah, that's great. And then it'll, for, your, for all the bindings you've made in mode maps, then they, they also will have their own sections and show you what you've done. So in ERC, I can see, well, I haven't run the ERC, which is probably why there's only one thing there, but like in Helm, in Helm there's only four keys I have overridden in its, in its local mode map. Yeah. Actually, it'd be really interesting to see which keys there are that you've overridden. I should go through your config and pick up some ideas from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also put a star on your bind. And what that says is that I want meta H to be ace jump mode, not just globally, but in every local binding that anybody ever creates. So it says, I want ah. this key to have this command always. And so that's called an overriding global map. And that's what the star means. It's very rare that you would need to use it, but every once in a while, there will be a key that you only want to mean one thing, and you don't want minor modes or major modes to be able to override that key. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Okay, so that's really cool. Um, sometimes I get confused about the difference between init and config, and people ask about that too. What should well, I remember? It's very confusing. <laughs> now it's simple. Init happens before the require, config happens after the require. Period. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if defer loading is happening, that means the config may not execute for a while, but the init will always execute at the time the use package macro is evaluated. Mm -hmm. I see. Whereas, so I... whereas the preface will happen when it's evaluated and when it's byte compiled. That's an important distinction between init and preface. Okay. I've, I'm going to have to wrap my mind around when I'm going to use one or the other. <laughs> When do you yeah. use one or the other? We'll, we'll do this. We'll look at what the expansion is going to be. Uh, so we'll we'll narrow down to just this use package declaration, and we'll say, um, oh, it, for some reason the the macro step does not like the bind keyword. Uh, okay, so <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> uh, let's also disable uh, temporarily the um, verbosity. That's that make it's making things noisy. Oops. Yeah. Okay. That's much better. All right. So we add to the load path at evaluation and compile time. We if we evaluate. We we have the preface at both evaluation and compile time, with no guarding, at all. Mm -hmm. Then we do the init block, but the init block is guarded so that the error does not raise a backtrace, does mm. not throw you into the debugger, or stop the rest of your init from being processed. Instead, it it will pop up a warnings buffer. 
when you're starting your Emacs to tell you, hey, I couldn't run your init block, and here's why. Then we do a soft require of the mode, and if it couldn't load, it's not a warning. It just is a message that I couldn't load. If it does load, then we process your config block, and if the config block fails, that is a warning. Mm -hmm. That should work. The init and the config block should always work. The preface block, because it needs to be more bare metal, will raise an exception, so you would need to do debug init to figure yeah. out why that might have failed. Yeah. But, but part of the goal here was that if I go to another platform, for example, and I run my, I run my Emacs, and because of differences in the environment, there's just things that are going to break over there, I still want to have a working Emacs with which to fix the problem. I really like that. Um, uh, before I used to have, of course, those, you know, every so often you would break your config and then you would start doing debug in it and kind of try to narrow mm -hmm. it down. So at least here, it just, you know, it goes through everything, gets you as much as, as it can, and then you can start narrowing down where the problem was. Right, and you don't have to edit your init file using a lobotomized Emacs while you're debugging. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that is very helpful. Um, okay. You can see on this AG example that I use nested use package a lot. Mm. Oh, so and, that's how you do the kind of dependency or like think co combinations of things. Right. So if AG is used, I also want to be using Helm AG. But again, not only is AG deferred, but Helm AG is also deferred. So I just want to make Helm AG available when AG is used. Then if I use Helm AG, I can also use that. But I cannot uh -huh. just use Helm AG. So if you, want, if you want to be able to do either one, you would have to put this outside. I see, I see. Okay. And then maybe, maybe do something like this, you know, to, uh, to force the load of AG, which would then cause any config you had for the AG use package to happen. Right. So this is how people would configure packages that depend on several packages. They would just, in their init, do a require of a bunch of things. Right. And uh, for the macro expansion, I actually will walk through your init and config blocks and recursively uh, expand any use package declarations I find there. Again, just for the efficiency. So you can see in this expansion, there's no sub use package. Yeah, yeah. Which nice. there, there used to be. Um, let's look at some other stuff. Uh, a lot, uh, I would say the prototypical use package declaration is like the BBDB one. Load yeah. path. Commands if they're not if they're not all bound bindings, that mm -hmm. would be I would say probably sixty percent of all my use package declarations are just that. Which if you have the package initialized like you do, you don't need that. You don't need that because it's going to provide both load path additions and auto loads for you. Mm -hmm. You only need to say I want to use BB2B and I want it to be bound to Meta Capital B. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, so use package uh, lets you do more complex configuration of things that, you know, maybe you, you want to use this combination, but only if you started going down that path in the first place, like if you needed it, um, and, um, and you can do that by nesting your use packages. Yeah, you can nest them. You can actually if guard them too, uh, like here in the, in the load of Mike Perrin, I want to say, uh, you, oh. I want to use Mike Perrin, but if Mike Perrin, for whatever reason, fails to configure, huh. I want to then just use Perrin. I had so. not considered that. That makes sense. <laughs> that's a, so it's a fallback use packages. Oh, that's a good, that's a good uh, workflow for that. And the number after the defer means don't load this, but five seconds after being idle, then load it. Mm. Now, if I had uh, a command here, so parent activate, let's say. Then immediately after loading my Emacs, um, I could run parent activate, and it would right then run the config. So it doesn't stop you from being able to demand load uh, packages by using whatever key you bound there or command you've defined there. It just says, I don't want to load this now, but if you're not doing anything else for five seconds, go ahead and load it then. Okay, so you would use the commands if you are impatient and you you have just started Emacs but you want to run Parent Activate right away. But on the other hand, since Parent Activate can take a while, then just waiting for the idle time of about five seconds or so and for that to kick in is also perfectly acceptable. Right, like with Lusty Explorer, um, I think I think it, is that it might be demand loaded. No, no, I have it demand loaded because I want to make sure that it's always available instantly and it's properly configured. Uh, but I do have other packages. Let's see. No. Okay. I, 
So to. demand is another keyword that I've never used, and that means loaded always. Yeah, right. if, 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 if the logic of use package would have otherwise deferred the loading, countermand that. Mm. Force the load to happen right now. Cool. I don't need these. The mode, the mode keyword can just be a string if, if the name of the module is the same as the name of the command that triggers the load. <laughs> that's so smart. <laughs> yeah, but that's something. That's also something somebody else put in support for. So I, mo I modernize my own use package declarations as I go. <laughs> All right. You know, I'm not aware of anything else that use package does. That's cool. Um, I'm sure if you know if people add more support. Uh, requests or interesting features, then uh, we can explore that. But even as it is, that it offers a lot of features for simplifying configurations. Mm -hmm. You can see here is a case where I need to use that colon map keyword to uh, to bind. Yeah, yeah, because oh. you have a lot of things. So let's do it. Let's do it, and then that'll force me to fix the bug that's stopping this from working. You have an unbind key there. How would how would the unbind work with a bind? Like, would you just bind it to nil? It. I'm going to have to do it this way. What, what, what was the question exactly? Yeah, so unbind. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And so it would then unbind relative to whatever map was currently yeah. the map in, in focus. So let's get rid of the bind key keyword here. And then let's say... <laughs> this is a interesting... Um, a demonstration of your Emacs Lisp editing workflow too, so that's yeah. cool. <laughs> Let me just get rid of that one extra space. Okay. <laughs> and then we want to wipe out the yeah, the presence of this because it's implied. Yeah. There, that's what it should look like uh, when tonight is over. You know, I don't use query replace nearly as much as I should be, um, based on looking at you, <laughs> your, uh, your, the way that you edit things. Query oh. replace is actually really helpful. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't use it all that much either, but there are a couple things. I, I actually tend to prefer uh, just replace string, the one uh. that do it without asking me from here to the end of the buffer. Yeah, but, yeah. And, and I would do that if I had, for example, done done this, you know, and then yeah, only if you solve it. Yeah, yeah. I've been I've been learning to use uh, multiple cursor modes for some some of that stuff too. So, just getting the hang of all these different things. Right. <laughs> okay, so use package, very cool. Um, people can get started with just a very simple use package with a you know bind or uh, config or init as um, as a way to set things up, and then as you as you get into more configuration, maybe you start playing around with. Um, with some of the other keywords there. Oh, one of the other things that I wanted to make sure people knew about was the, that verbosity feature, uh, the verbosity option that you turned off when you were expanding things, but um, but when you turn it on, it's it's very useful for identifying performance. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, profiling your Emacs startup. Uh, if we go and look at the beginning of my startup, this is what the verbosity ends up looking like. So yeah. it's not only, it's, it's showing you f which packages were being loaded, so they're being required in, and then which packages are, had a config block that is being executed. And if any of those operations take longer than a tenth of a second, then the time will also be displayed. Mm -hmm. That way you can very quickly by eye see who's slow. Like, it takes a long time to load ERC, apparently, 0.6 seconds. <laughs> um, don't even know why that loaded at all. And then here it tells me that my whole init took 2.8 this time, um, and then after the init hook was run, then it, it, that added another 1.8 seconds. Because I do things like have my org mode get displayed after the init hook and, and yeah. such. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. So I, I looked into profiling my .emacs, but because I, I use a separate file, um, I keep my, my Emacs in an org file, then mm -hmm. it, it, it was struggling with that a little bit, but use package with ver the verbosity uh, option on just worked for all of that stuff, which is nice. Yeah, I've been thinking about, I mean, my ideal for my init file would be to have it be only use package declarations from the top to the bottom. Except for um, the and, part where you require use package. <laughs> for the very first line. Because uh, I think that if I, if I turn on, if I use control, uh, if I use meta2 control x dollar to collapse away everything that begins 
Huh. Uh, that's very pretty, actually. So if I go from this point down, except for that or, where I did the conditional inclusion of Mike Perrin, yeah. it should only be used package lines. And I would of course, love it if that was true of the whole file. People watching this video will be like, what was that key, you know, key, key binding he just used to collapse everything? <laughs> Uh, it's control x dollar and then you give it a numeric prefix to say how many columns in you want to cut at uh, so if i do to control x dollar it says anything that is at column two on hide it mm. and then you expand the tab uh you just type control x dollar without a numeric prefix and that will undo it yeah uh, oh, if okay I, so if I did can... form at x dollar you would see yeah. now i have the top level keywords yeah everything. And you, so you can't just expand a little bit of it. Uh, no, no. For okay. that, you need something like high chill mode, yeah, yeah. for example. To okay. Do... So wandering off topic with all the interesting things that I see you doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much, so much that could be done. Okay. So, um, but use package is a great place to start.